I got, uh, I have to say, I got hooked walking into Gleason's gym in Brooklyn and watching guys, it was so physical that day I walked in and it might have been suplexes or it might have been something, but they were trying to learn something and I happened to walk in there in the middle of a training session and sat in and watched it and just was fascinated by the fact that, you know, mm. there was two guys in there I was bigger than, but they were, you know, going at each other pretty good and I was like, wait a minute, this isn't... Yeah, wrestling, wrestling. This is you know pro wrestling. I had no idea when I walked in what I was in for, and I just you know, I just took it as a challenge and you know started out yeah. as a little bit of a challenge and wound up with a 22 year career. So yeah. I'm not sure what got me there. I'm not sure what keeps me going. All I know is uh, it's hard to stay away from it. It's mm. you know, even the the biggest critics can't stay away from critiquing what we do because yeah. we draw them in. And I got drawn in at an early age and. Actually, not so early. These kids here are 16, 17 when they started. Yeah, I think course. I was 22, 23. So I was a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. Just lucky, just blessed, and been around ever since. Did you play sports as a kid? Were you just active, or was it just something that came naturally? You I, know? I started playing football uh, junior year in high school, a little bit of wrestling. Went on to play football in college, and uh, did you know just did different things that way. Late bloomer, you know, in sports, but watching watching the business and watching guys like Neidhart and Bigelow and, and John Studd and guys like that there had to be something that made me stand out different than the rest so being big wasn't good enough and I had people in my ear that hey try this big guys don't do this Moonsault. big heavy guys don't do yeah. this big and I just kept going and it kind of fit for me so I kind of and people started to put that over you know and then Later years, you know, I'd be called the human Humvee and the world's largest cruiserweight and all that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, so I kind of, I kind of like that, but I kind of like doing things that nobody else would expect from a 350-pound guy. How'd you break into WCW, and did you have to go through their power plant, which was pretty grueling, from what I've heard? No, I, I never did. I actually went on later to train some guys at the power plant, make some appearances, and help some guys out. But I came right from, uh, from uh, Japan. Kevin Sullivan brought me in. Uh, Big Van Vader had an mm. altercation with Paul Orndorff was the way I got it. They asked me if I was still big and heavy and did I still wrestle. And I answered yes. And on a side note, Mike Moraldo's girlfriend is hot. <laughs> but yeah. I do nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they literally Sullivan picked up the phone. You still fat? You still wrestling? I answered yes to both. They flew yeah. me to Macon, Georgia. Boom, I'm That's part of the. WCW. And how'd you get the name Hugh Morris? I mean, since the place they kind of caught on, obviously. I, I just, uh, I did it. I did a promo for Randy Savage. I laughed in between when I had nothing to say, just me being, just me being Bill. And they said, "Can you do that every night?" And I said, "Do what?" And they said, "That laugh." I said, "I didn't mean to do that." They, I apologized. They said, "No, do it again." So I cut another promo for Randy Savage. Next thing I know, I'm on Saturday Night Main Event with the question marks. And they called me the man of question because they still didn't have a name. Well, they saw the promo on TV, you know, very, very humorous. Mm -hmm. But the, the announcers and the commentators broke it up into Hugh Morris. So it wasn't humorous, it was Hugh Morris. So people weren't getting it, I didn't get it, so they had the laughing man, Hugh Morris. Mm -hmm. So then everybody understood the humor, mm -hmm. but that's that's mm -hmm. just how it came about. Porno? No! No? There you go. They eat corn hey, dogs in the Northeast? Yeah. Corn dog and pretzels. Guys, excuse me. This people. is the best excuse interview in the world. Excuse me, guys. We're in the middle of an interview. And, Not uh, Coors Light. Corn dogs and pretzels. Corn dogs and pretzels. I and mean, mustard. Oh, that's and mustard. That's too much salt. This is that's why way I'm in too much. That's I mean, way too much salt. Can you corn dog? Well, sure. Thank you. I guess. I've never had a corn dog before, actually. And so. you say I have a sense of humor? He comes in with two corn dogs oh my and God. two pretzels. Guys, we're here with uh, you know, Hugh Morris. You know, we got you know our staff member, Phil Obermeyer. He's just bringing pretzels and... Uh, and the mustard. And mustard and everything. Uh, <laughs> Classic yeah, yellow yeah, mustard. Oh my god, you guys, two, two things, you guys are great at timing and being discreet, man, it's awesome. <laughs> class, class, class. It's not like we're discussing his WCW tenure or anything like that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank Which you. is on. the equivalent of one pretzel and a corn dog. <laughs> come on, come on. Come, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> that's never actually happened yeah. before you. That's awesome. That, that's, that's what happens when you talk about the misfits. Oh you my god. Corn dogs and so... When did you initially get up to the point where you were like, okay, you went from being in WCW, I'm sure the initial shock was, holy crap, I'm on TV, yeah. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. When did you get up to that point where you were like, okay, they know I'm talented in the ring, 
I've been on TV for a few months, or you know, a few years at that at that point. I wanted some freaking direction around here. Did Never. you did you go up to them no. or did they just kind of decide to do Never. something with you? Never. It wasn't my job. My job was to do what I was told. I just never, I never, that's the right way of saying it. I never, not that I didn't like take the, the initiative. Yeah. I just did what I was, I knew my job. I knew what was expected. I mean, I did it and I was hoping that somewhere down the line my turn would come. That's the way business should be. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. that's the way I, I, that's the way I was taught. That's the way I approached my. So career. you know, you stayed away from all the crazy uh, yeah, politics. I'm not everything. a politician by any means. Mm -hmm. I think the internet will prove that. People who <laughs> talk about me will definitely say, you "Build them out of no politician." Hey, it sounds like you know, a cartoony gimmick, but it got, but yeah, it got over. Got over. Got over. And when you when you first heard it, they were gonna call you General Rection. Huge G Rection. I had to go out on a pay per view against Scott Steiner for the United States Championship. Up until that point. I was just, right at that point, I was filling in. I had a few good matches, weekend matches, stuff like that. Every once in a while, I'd come out of the woodwork. And uh, Booker Booker had a concussion or something. And Booker was not going to make the show. They looked around. They wrote something up and said, we're going to change your name. I didn't ask any questions. They said, read it. I read it. I walked in the office. I told Russo and Farrar they were crazy. You don't want to do it? Just say you don't want to do it. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm just letting you know you're crazy. And I walked out in front of the whole world and said, my name is Hugh G. Rection. And then you had the option right then and there, taking it and running with it and making something out of it or falling on your face and making a one-night stand. I chose to make a run with it and turn whatever it was, whether it was a rib or whether it was a one-night thing, I was going to turn it into something. And that's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I mean, it went... You had, great, great, you had yeah, a great group of guys. Great, I mean, you, yeah. had you had Chavo Guerrero, you had Booker T, you know, before you made a better. The Wall. Yeah. We brought in Tyleen, who uh -huh. is now a very interesting star in a different area yeah, in a of different entertainment. Era. This is meant more for adults. Yes. So, hey, you know, whatever, whatever makes you I become an adult, I will log on to her website. Until then, I'm banned. <laughs> the, the point that I think we tried to prove or what we went to do was the same thing we did every night before they reckoned. I mean, Lance came in and, and Ace, Ace Darling's girlfriend is smoking hot. Yeah, hey, Ace, how you doing, man? But um, the, we did the same thing we did before. Lance had more notoriety. Lance came in; he was hot. He had all three, all three belts and everything like that. So the proof was in the pudding. I didn't go out and do anything. If everybody goes back and looks at it, the same things that General Erection did were the same things that Hugh Morris did. Were the same things that Crash did. The Big Sweet William did. That you know when I started. Yeah. It's just that once it's noticed, people perceive it differently, it, yeah. and they pick up on it and they go, "Wow." That's awesome. No, it's the same shit I've been doing since Jump Street. So we didn't go out to prove anything. We just went out to go, we could have been doing this two years ago. We could have been doing this last year. But now that you've noticed, and that's what we did. We had a lot of fun. It was uh, interesting at times, but it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it wholeheartedly. It was scary. How surreal was that? Very scary. Thought I was going to go back to Japan and work the rest of my career there, or whatever the case was. And within a day or two, I got a phone call saying they picked me up and Thank God, welcome yeah. to the WWF. And I went, oh, okay, cool. Very yeah, laid, yeah. very laid back, but very regimented. The politics that floated in WCW wouldn't even hold water in, in WWF at the time. And a lot of guys had a rude awakening, as you saw every week on TVs and in the back. And I mean, we were going through talent like, you know, through a strainer. We just couldn't, guys just couldn't keep their jobs and guys couldn't keep their positions because it was different. Now they had to play. Vince's game. We went from triple A ball to the pros. And I'm not knocking WCW, I'm just saying well, the, the way atmosphere, run, yeah. the way it was run, you know, it's kind of like the inmates ran the asylum a little bit. I'm not down in the bookers, just the inmates ran the asylum. And you knew the warden ran it with WWF. And Plus, we had a lot more guys we had to deal with. So you added 30 guys to a roster that was already full and strong. Now we had to walk in and prove ourselves. I had a brief segment with. With Chavo, I believe it was Rebellion 2001. Yeah, yeah, you know, in fun. London. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think they're in Rome? I mean, it was it was awesome. So I remember watching. It. I was like thinking, you guys have natural chemistry, and they, just they kinda... loved it. They went with it, and but the flight from the flight back from London to when we got back to Newark, something happened. Someone suggested something else, and it just went south. Just you know, just so many guys, so many things. I think it was yeah. threatening to a lot of guys when we came in, and they're like, "Wow, we like that." And people go, wait a minute, I've been here four years trying to get that wow, I like that. So, understandable. Went to announcing. Was it hard for you to transition? It was hard to get used to their set of rules. Uh, I always knew is that as in, when announcers were talking about me and they broke away and started talking about a pay-per-view or whatever yeah. the case is, I found that rude because you're out there doing your best. So when yeah, I, when I came in, 
I want to talk about what those guys were doing at that time. Give me a reason. That's why I told everybody that I ever had a match in front of me. I would go up to them, no disrespect. I tell them, no disrespect. Give me a reason to talk about you, so I don't have to talk about Skittles or uh, the next sponsor. Fruity, fruity, yeah. And they, you know, they get the uh, production to be pissed. See, corn dog. No, I'm good, brother. Thank you. But you know, they get pissed because they'd be like, "You got to announce it." No, let Josh talk about that. I'm talking wrestling. That's what I do. And that's something I, I noticed that with Velocity, it catered. I'm not saying it catered to you know, a casual fan, but also smart fans. Like when you're watching like pre one matches like Brian Danielson or something like that, that was like a known indie star. That and was Mike Baraldo's hot girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah, I, you talk about those guys. Those guys were there for a reason. You know, Crash Hollywood, was there. If, when Bob Holly was on Velocity, you don't talk about the next pay-per-view or what this guy did. You talk about how Bob Holly's the toughest. Yeah, you talk about that. what's going on in the ring. Make the people appreciate. You know, the guys wanted to be appreciated. And for a lot of people, they thought Velocity was a step down. It's TV, it's wrestling, so you still put it over the same way you would anything else. So that's the that's the take I took on it, and I enjoyed 13, 13 months of that. You know, I was in Velocity a long time, uh -huh. and I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was a lot of fun. I think you hold like the streak for most squash matches ever on TV. I mean, it was, ever, ever. I mean, it was you know every week you're just destroying something. I thought that character was just badass. And Came then, out of tough enough, and I was killing people. And then it just. Came off the TV. Now, was that something your decision, or was that? No, nope, it wasn't my decision. It was uh, one of those famous wrestling terms. Hey, we're going to go a different way with that. And a matter of fact, I was getting the best of Rikishi in a lot of those matches, and it felt, you know, disrespectful because that wasn't the way things were supposed to go. It was supposed to be a big program leading into a big pay per view blow up, and it was like, okay, I got the best out of him a whole bunch of times, mm -hmm. and it was just okay. We're going to go a different way, Bill. And, like that's wrestling. You take you take wrestling for what it is, man. If you take it personally, it eats you up a lot. I was the trainer. Okay. I was the guidance Deep counselor, scout. the the scout. Huge heat. <laughs> <laughs> the you know I was everything. I went to OVW and uh, I did my thing there and did velo the whole time I was doing velocity. I was doing tough enough and I was training at OVW. Then they came with the new developmental area, which is Deep South. So I moved everything to Georgia. And we did uh, the Deep South for WWE. So, for the better part of, I, I guess, eight years with WWE, I did just about everything under the sun mm -hmm. for him. And did you enjoy working with all that? You know, all the young talent? I love things. training guys and helping them to figure out what they do best and make sense out of what they want to do and, and try to give them insight on how to get there. Mm -hmm. I think the best way for someone to give advice is to be able to back it up. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think over over 22 years I can back it up, you know, Absolutely. and show these guys, listen, go this route. And the proof is in the pudding. In Deep South, we had, I think, 30 guys made it out of Deep South. Yeah. So for a company that was only open for a year and a half, that's a hell of a turnover. And The Miz. <laughs> Mike Mazzana. When you saw him, I know he had a lot of doubters at first. Did you see, did you see something in him? When, you know? when he came, I, I met Mike in a few charity events. He was doing the MTV thing, and we did a few charity events. I met him, didn't think anything of it. Uh, he told me about wrestling. He's a big fan. I saw him on his TV show, and he, you know, drunk and wrestling. And, and when he came to the million-dollar oh, tough enough. Thank you, man. Thank you. Oh, um, now it brings pizza. Here you want? No, you it's too sure? late now. I'm stuck. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but when he came to Million Dollar Tough Enough, I sat him down. I said, you're going to have to prove yourself to no one else first but me. Because then you put time in it. And that's the same thing Al told him. And the freaking Mike Mizanin has gone the way he should have gone. And he's a freaking legitimate star. Mm -hmm. As, you know, as anybody. As, as same as John Morrison who came through the Tough Enough. And Matt Capitelli, who, you know, got hurt. But, God bless him, but he was good. Maven, yeah. Maven was freaking great. And Josh... You know, went on to be the commentator, and he's still doing that today, but he's in the business that he came into, you know, so I get a big kick out of Miz, and every time I get a chance, if I can give a shout out to him, and I, I just like all those guys to know, they're freaking doing awesome, I'm proud of them, I was proud to be, if I helped them in any way, I'm, I'm grateful for that, because it's just... It, you know, makes you appreciate the things you do. Was that something saying, "Hey, we want to go in a different direction"? Yeah, they were that? going. To, they were going to Tampa, and I think you know, with all the internet jabber about certain guys who had lost their job in the developmental. Did you get here? Hey, Mike, how's that girlfriend of yours? She's hot. Yeah, I know she is. Thank you, Mike. Smoking. Hey, darling, everyone. Man. And um, that's big heat. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just. It is what it is, and perceptions, realities, what people read on the internet and what they hear. But I love 
wrestling. WWE called and said, even after all the crap you went through, what'd you do to get hell yeah? TNA called hell yeah. And ISPW called and said, would you do this thing after two? Hell yeah. Well, I love wrestling. Well, you gotta get on Facebook, man. I, it's even, computers. Even Kevin Kelly's on Facebook. Kevin Come on. Kelly's the Dick Clark of professional wrestling. He never ages. <laughs> Like, I just turned 31, and he's, he's, I know he's got to be he's 33. He's like the, the Tony LaRusso All-Stars. They just stay the same, Unbelievable. Man. Unbelievable. Well, you looking pretty good for your age. You know, you got 45. the hair. 45. Wow, man. That's 45. Don't tell anybody. Uh, this, don't tell anybody. No, don't tell anybody. No, we won't tell anybody, Internet. No, 45. Wow, man. We, you're looking good, my man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, you know. I enjoy, you were in heat. You, 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 uh, he was on velocity. velocity. Yeah, get it right, man. Al right. Snow was heat. I was velocity. Yeah, no, Al, actually, Al Stone, according to Stevie Richards. Al Stone. Oh, man. Speaking of Stevie Richards. <laughs> Can I, I, I walk by you? You look like Arn for a second. Wow! What do you call him, Arn Anderson? Oh, man. Arn's older than me. Oh, man. That's hey, there goes that good looking horses. good for a 45. Oh, man. Well, we'll get you out of here on this. One piece of advice to people that, you know, may not necessarily have access to uh, build a mop, you know, in their area or whatever. What's one piece of advice you give to somebody breaking into their business or just coming up right now? If you're a young stud and you're breaking into this business and you're trying hard and you're giving it your all, at the end of the day when you put your head on the pillow, remember this. It's just wrestling. Don't consume yourself with it. Don't beat yourself up because these young cats that are 18, 19, 20, and they finally, if they're, if they're blessed to get the chance when they're 25, they're already miserable because they've done so much and put so much pressure on them. At the end of the day, everybody out there, boys, girls, referees, managers, whoever it is, columnists, at the end of the day, it's just wrestling. That's it, at the end of the day. The people who do it don't think about it, so... If you aspire to be what you're watching on TV, just, it's just wrestling. Well, Bill DeMott, thank you so much. Thank you, you know, brother. Pleasure.